Great to be here. I'm very excited and there's a lot to get through. So we're going to move um, straight on to what we're talking about, which is the series called Essential Maths from Cambridge. And what I'd like to do is talk about all the great features of the series, but also some of the new things that we've been doing over the last couple of years. So I'd like to get started firstly by saying this is Scott Halligan um, from the publishing department in at Cambridge and there's, there's no question that he can't answer as well. So between the two of us, we should be, we should be good tonight. So I'd, I'd just like to start with this question. What resources do I like to have in most topics? Because most days we're seeing our classes and we need activities, we need assessment, we need teacher documentation. And this is the type of question I think we are asking on a daily basis. We don't want to be searching on the internet for a set of interconnected or disconnected um, resources. We want a range of connected resources, but we don't have to want to hunt every single time we want to plan a lesson. So what classroom activities, what tasks, there's all sorts of things that we would like to get through the, the next lesson and teach the topics that are coming up. So here are some of the things which I think are really important. Number one, a really good and solid, rich collection of problems. I've always believed that if students are not solving problems, they're probably not going to be doing much maths. So we need lots of problems for them to solve, which obviously cover the curriculum content, but uh, we have a variety of them. Uh, they are graded in a certain way so that there's a reasonable level of development for all students. And we cover the proficiency strands in the Australian curriculum. Not just fluency questions, but understanding, problem solving and reasoning as well. So that's really important. The second thing is uh, what information for teaching and learning can we offer? What, what types of things do you do at the start of the class? What activities do you like to run? Do you do something with digital at the start? Do you watch videos at the start of your lesson? Do you have particular activities where you get students out of their chairs and so on? You'll notice in red there's a little feature there, and that's something I'm going to talk about in detail later. Can anyone guess what the red parts might mean for this afternoon? Correct. New material. Okay, we also expect to have differentiated learning paths, don't we? That's, this is very important. Uh, we want to revise certain content from previous years or previous lessons. We want to cover the core content and we want to enrich as well extend or accelerate. And so we need to have the ability to offer different courses and pathways and groups of questions to accommodate uh, a high level of streaming in a school, if that's the way the school's going, or to accommodate different levels of abilities in classes if, if no streaming is in that school. Some real world context. How many times in a topic are you looking for something else apart from just doing a test with short answer questions? We know we should be offering a little bit more for our students. Is that extended response questions? Is it a problem solving task? Is it um, an assignment or an investigation? And you can see the things that are in red that I'll talk about in more detail soon. Of course, digital. Digital resources are always changing and being improved. So what type of things can we give students that are marked by ourselves, but other things that we can perhaps set that are auto-marked? A big one, if we're using tablets or iPads, can we allow students to find the solutions to problems and show their working at the same time, and not just clicking an answer on their digital resources? This is something that um, we think is important. Videos, for example, where we expect as well. Teacher resources, of course, the tests and worksheets. Um, formative assessment, not just assessment at the end of a topic. Um, curriculum documentation, like uh, the learning intentions, or how does something link to the Australian curriculum content descriptors? Uh, what are the, what's the success criteria, for example, for a particular topic? 
Okay, so now you have a task to do because what you're going to do is find the Year 7 sample pages, Chapter 11 from Year 7 Essential Maths. And what I'd like to do is just uh, run through a couple of features and I'd like to see if you could find them as we talk about them. Okay, so the first thing I'd like you to try to find is the contents which are uh, at the beginning of the chapter. This is a snippet from the contents at the opening pages for chapter 11. And you see, you'll see here that <coughs> the, the sections for, for the chapter are listed and you'll notice some things in red. And those things are there to help teachers decide what course, what overall course they'd like to offer their students. So there is th three categories, there are three categories to look at. They include consolidating material, extending material and the core material. The core material, as you would guess, is material which covers the Australian curriculum content for that year level. The consolidating material is material that the authors have felt has to be here and it's critical to revise before we move through into the content of that year level. And they're called the consolidating sections. So using and converting metric lengths uh, is covered fairly strongly in junior school, grades five and six, but it's revised here importantly before moving on to units of area, as is the concept of perimeter. However, area of composite shapes, you may know, is officially in year eight of the Australian curriculum. But I think at year seven, there is an opportunity to extend the measurement course and cover some composite shapes. Um, perhaps not at the level of year eight, year nine, but certainly it's possible and what that can be done. There's also a couple of sections there that revise capacity, mass and temperature, which is covered in grade six. Interestingly for this topic, it starts off with an extending section which is very unusual and that does not happen very much in the series. But it's very difficult I think to start a topic in measurement of year seven without talking about some historical aspects of measurement. For example, the definition of the metre being one ten millionth of the distance between the North Pole and the equator passing through Paris. Nice definition, don't you think? I don't think it's the same definition today, but, but it's, it's nice to talk about the, those things. As well as understanding the place value or the value of measurement systems through uh, other systems around the world, like uh, the imperial system, for example. It's good to have an appreciation of those things, even though they're not in the curriculum. All right, so those features are true for all the chapters. All right, now this one is in red. This is one of the new features. So the learning intentions are a list of goals, if you like, for the students in this particular section. Uh, these goals are written in a language uh, like this, to understand what a composite shape is, to be able to identify simple shapes that make up a composite shape, and to be able to find areas of composite shapes. So these are the key things that the students should be able to do and will aim to achieve in this section. By the way, these learning intentions will be grouped together for teachers in a Word document. So if you're preparing your courses and showing your, your curriculum person what you'll be achieving in each topic, these, these documents will be there in a Word document and available for teachers on the teacher site. Now these are available in every section. And for those wanting to drill down a little bit deeper into the Australian curriculum for the particular content descriptors, even further than the elaborations, then perhaps the learning intentions is what the detail is. So they're at the start of every lesson. Another new feature is a hook for the lesson. Something perhaps to read, 
to talk about at the start of the lesson that students might find interesting. So here's another one. You can have a look at any section and you'll find that there'll be a photo and a caption explaining a particular application of this section here. So this one's about areas of triangles and there's a, a short story about the Flatiron Building in New York and what shape it is and just talking about the fact that it's an isosceles triangle. So those connections are made at the start of every section and work with the introduction. That is a new feature. One of the old features which we've we've updated slightly is the lesson starter. This is a new one for example where students are looking at doubling the size of a triangle through a transformation of some form to form a, a parallelogram. And then if we already know that the area of a parallelogram is base times height, then that clearly tells us something about the area of a triangle. So it's a really nice way of coming up with the area of the triangle formula from the area of a parallelogram. So we have a few lead-in questions that might help teachers create a short activity at the start of the lesson. And they are at the beginning, those types of things are at the beginning of every section as well. Of course, everyone expects a series or a resource to have a good summary, comprehensive but concise summary of all the important results of that particular section. And they're called the key ideas. Now something new here as well. This section is essentially part of the introduction of a section in the series for each lesson. And it's called building understanding. And these questions have been written to be set up so that teachers could use them in a discussion. If you have a look through your booklet and perhaps find this one or perhaps another one, you'll see that most of the questions are set up so that students don't necessarily have to write an answer down. They could, and there are answers in the back of the book for teachers and students to check, but these are questions which encourage a discussion about some of the basic concepts and ideas in this particular section. So this, is, um, this section here is about capacity and at the very beginning of capacity you'd expect the teacher to talk through with students some of these things. How many mils for example in a litre? Picking up on things that they perhaps learned from previous years and trying to connect those with the new elements of the lesson. Which, which state, which volumes are the same and from the options on the left which capacity would be best chosen to match those particular volumes. So the questions are worded in such a way that it would encourage teachers to use them as a discussion point rather than getting students to write answers down. And that's the beginning of each lesson as well. Of course we expect a series to have examples and we've stuck with our theme of having key examples, two or three, perhaps sometimes four or five per section, with a solution, what we want students to write on the left, and an explanation or diagrams to help understand what the, what the solution is on the right hand side, and a video for each example as well. Right, a new feature, we mentioned this before. One thing the authors realised as they're teaching but also talking to different teachers, we realise that a lot of teachers like to use textbook examples to do their teaching on the board. It could be to watch the video, or they might get their students to watch the video, or it could be that they use the examples on the board and work through them with their students. In which case, there's an opportunity there really to have another similar example. Because, okay, you've copied this down and we've worked together, but could you do that one now on your own? And so we've decided for every example to come up with a very similar example, and it's called a Now You Try. And the solutions to those are also provided in the text, in the answer section.
All right, now you'll notice there's a little bit of red in the title. I wasn't sure where to put the red because uh, a lot of these features are very similar to what you might be used to. But I just wanted to point out that when we're trying to differentiate within the classroom and from one exercise that we have made some modifications to the way in which we've chosen the different courses. So you can see the tabs with all the number choices up on the right hand side. I've snipped out a little bit of fluency, um, problem solving and reasoning and enrichment. I've just snipped out the choices. So for those who are unfamiliar, the left hand choice is called foundation. And that includes the very first question, which corresponds exactly to the first example. No tricks no nuances or anything like that, it's just direct, same as the first example. And they're getting that question, they're getting a selection from most of the fluency, they're getting the easiest problem solving and reasoning questions and not the enrichment question. That's the foundation selection of problems. The middle sits somewhere in the middle between foundation and advanced. You can see the choices there for 11B, and the advanced are usually getting less fluency questions. They're getting a stronger and harder level of problem solving, reasoning, and they're also getting the enrichment question. So there's been some modifications there, but you'll notice that we have some fractions being used as well. And in this series, we do use the fractions a half, one third, and a quarter to give us more flexibility to make realistic courses for students. So if we want these, perhaps the advanced students, doing less than a half some for, from some relatively repetitive fluency questions, we've sometimes gone to a third and a quarter as well to make courses that students can actually get through without loss of experience through that course. So a few changes there as well. Thank you, Scott. Um, say that one of the things that David mentioned was the there are a couple of things that are implicit here. So one is that the you'll notice if you use essential uh, the, this series in the past, the understanding questions are no longer in the exercise. So we still cover the understanding proficiency strand in every lesson, but as David um, talked about before, that is now covered in that that little feature called building understanding. It's more of a discussion type activity. Uh, following on from the key ideas. So we found that putting those that type of content directly after the worked examples at the start of the exercise was a little bit of an interruption. So you would, things would go logically in mm. sequence from the key ideas to the worked examples and all of a sudden we had these kinds of questions that were more remedial um, that didn't follow directly from the worked examples. So now what follows directly is these fluency questions and as David mentioned it's sort of the heart of the, the exercise. Mm. As David mentioned, there, there's a new first question which is always directly tied to the first worked example. So previous editions that, that wasn't the case and now mm. it's much more consistent and much more That's um, right. sequentially uh, efficient. And so, and so your weakest students will have the option of doing that first question as you can see and the, the direct correlation between that question and the example. There are correlations, of course, right across the exercise <clears throat> and the example links carry all the way through. And you can see from a whole exercise, the links to the examples are clear. All right, so that's kind of in-class differentiation from the same exercise. I just wanted to show this because this is like the Bible for me at work. Um, you can see it, it's actually a Cambridge document, but uh, it comes as a Word document for teachers. And I've thrown a little bit of my school's details up there. So when we print it and send it home, it's become a document for my school. So I can say, what, what are this, what's the key assessment for my topic? There's a test, there's a formative quiz, there's a task, which is a general word for like a problem set or an investigation. <laughs> And there's 10% allocated to um, your classwork and homework. But more importantly, it's like this is like a fallback position for all the teachers 
who are teaching um, a particular class. So lesson one corresponds to 2A, for example. This is year 10. Our topic, is, uh, our topic six is geometry. Lesson one, and all those tabs that you saw in the textbook, all those numbers are in here. So for my year 10 standard maths class, the default setting for this is their work schedule will be the middle column called standard. And I want my students in standard maths to be following the middle, middle column. And that corresponds to what's in the text. It's a Word document. It's on the teacher resources for people who uh, use the series. And you can adjust this to suit if you wish as well. And this will be updated for the series. It's nice to have the advanced and the foundation there as well because within my class I might like to say, well, okay, you seem to be going quite well. Um, I want you to pick up some of the extra problems that are only in the advanced column as well. So at my school we have one of those documents for every topic. And as staff we work together to make sure we finish roughly at the right time. Um, it's also good for students who might be away and they want to know exactly what we're doing on every lesson. This document covers that. A lot of students, however, don't need this printed because it's all in the textbook anyway. But it's, it's nice to come up with something like that to drive the progression through the topics that you're doing at school. All right, now the, on ter in terms of formative assessment, you are already aware, I think, that we have this thing called a progress quiz, positioned around about halfway through a topic. In the new series, this will be available as a printable worksheet as well. So if you'd like to use it as a test or a quiz, um, you'll be able to download this. There'll be spaces provided for student working and you can print that off as well. That's called the progress quiz. Okay, new feature. When you're going through a topic, it's nice, isn't it, to have something other than textbook exercises all the way through a topic, of course. We're looking for other activities, problem solving tasks, app application, uh, investigations, and so on. So we decided that <coughs> at our schools, for the, at the author schools, we're always looking to come up with something about two-thirds of the way through the topic to start applying what they've learnt um, through some applications or problem solving or extended response type tasks. So you may wish to have a look in your sample and find this one. It's about two-thirds of the way through the exercise and it's called Applications and Problem Solving. And there are three extended response type questions which attempt to apply the mathematics of the section. The first question is about painting a bedroom and taking into account the length and the width of all the walls and the ceiling, uh, looking at the doors and the windows and there's quite a bit to it. And the problem is scaffolded through different parts that the students can work through. Teachers will get an answer and su suggested solution to this and there's, there will also be a printable version of these with spaces. So if teachers did want to hand this out to students as a task, that will be available as well. That's called applications and problem solving. That might sit well also with the investigations that the, the series already has and is available as a teacher resource that have already been in the text for a while. There is a page of high-end problems and challenges for those who finish early. That's still available. The mind map seems to be very popular. So a quick summary on one page of everything in that chapter in, um, in a concise manner. This is in the review. A new feature is called success criteria. So you, you might remember that at the start of every section we have these learning intentions, which are the things we want to be able to achieve in the section. <clears throat> and at the end of the section, we have a summary of the success criteria. What can I do now at the end of the chapter? 
or at the end of a topic at school, what can I do? Can I convert units within the Roman system if I'm including section 11a? Or if I'm including section 11b, can I read a length scale? So the authors have gone through right through the system and said, right, what are the top 20 odd things that I really need to have been able to achieve in this topic? And these are listed in a double page spread in each chapter with the links as, as well as anything that con connects to the extension sections are labelled as well. So if you need to cut some things out, you can easily cut them out of success criteria as well. And of course, chapter review. We have decided though this time to swap the multiple choice and the short answer in terms of position. I'm not sure what you feel, but when you write multiple choice questions, it can be a bit of a gap filler multiple choice in terms of covering the content on an assessment piece. So you have all the things that you want to test really in short answer, you have some extended response questions, and you use your multiple choice carefully and intelligently to pick up a few other bits and pieces. And we felt that it was probably more important to do the short answer first, get a good coverage of the topic before moving on to the multiple choice and the extended response. So we have switched the order of those. Okay, now everything I've shown you so far is fairly static, so I'd like to now move over and show you a lot of those things again, but in a digital format. Okay, so I'm now in the interactive version of the textbook and I'm in currently in year 10, uh, linear relations first topic and you can see some, all the features that you expect are there. Um, one new feature that we've added, which uh, I haven't showed yet, is the pretests. Now we've always already had a prior knowledge pretest, which are those basic ideas that you really need to have picked up on in previous years before you start the unit. And that's our prior knowledge pretest that used to be printed into the text. But we've also added what's called a diagnostic pretest. And that, that is really a test of the content of the topic. So if you want to find out where your students are at in terms of the content of what's coming up, then that is the second test that's been added. I'll just quickly jump onto one of those so you can see that these have been constructed now in a way that they can be all auto-marked. You set this the night before, perhaps you start the topic, um, students can run through and all these things are automatic, automatically marked and the data appears onto the, on the teacher database. All right, so that's the prior knowledge pretest and the diagnostic pretest. I'll now just go, jump into a section which is where students will spend most of their time. And you should be fairly familiar with how this would work, but you can see all the features at the start of a section, like the learning intention I mentioned, the photo and caption hook, the lesson starter, the key ideas, and all the, and the building understanding questions. And the examples are all available. Um, here with links off, so I might just, let's, let's just quickly have a look at this example. And the now you try there with the answers are available. Clicking off to the video. In let's this example we're going to be expanding brackets using the distributive rule. Let's first consider 2 times x plus 4. Well to deal with that we're going to multiply the 2 by x giving us 2x and the 2 by 4 giving us plus h. I've put some little marks there in red. Once you've had some practice with the distributive law, you don't generally put them into your solution. Next we have negative 3x times x minus y. And multiplying negative 3x by x gives us negative 3x squared. And multiplying negative 3x by negative y gives us positive 3xy. If you're not sure about that, the facts I've used there are that negative 3x times x, we've got x times x is x squared, and we have the negative 3 out the front and negative 3x times negative 1y, or negative 3 times negative 1 is positive 3, and we have x times y. So that's why our final answer is negative 3x squared plus 3xy. Okay, so you get the idea. So all the examples have those links available, of course. 
Okay, so further to that, I'd like to now move through to the exercise. And I'd like to just talk about how that's going to be set up in the new series. So as per the textbook, all the questions in the text are there in the digital format. And you can see a reminder of the three different tabs are there as well if students are using, say, the work schedule that I talked about before. Uh, the links to the examples are there on the right hand side to watch the videos and all the questions are there. A new feature though is this little box which I'll just open up slightly if I can. There we are, a little bit slow today. Okay, so in that box if students are using the digital version they can type solutions which I would not recommend usually. Um, they can handwrite their solutions onto their tablet or iPad, or if they do their work elsewhere, they can upload an image of their, of their work into that box. And all of their work is saved onto the system and visible by the teacher. So it could be that you have nothing to do at 10 p.m. at night and you'd like to see what, how much homework your students are doing. It is possible to go in and check all their working that they've done if you're a school that is using a tablet or um, iPad, say, for example. So that's a great little feature. I'll just pop down to the end of an exercise. You can open and close. Of course, your school may not. Um, have that, uh, that uh, facility where students do that. Of course, they could do their exercises somewhere else, but we thought it was important to make it available. Now, Scott, if you could just talk a little bit about the feedback that students can give their, their teacher, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, so do you have the ability, Dave, to put anything, some just in that? Uh, I'll try. Just by my, with my finger at yeah, the moment. Fine. Yep. It's like magic. It's like that show Ghost Rider. Okay. Good. Um, so, if, a, if once a student uh, puts their working in that spot, the next step, and they can do it after every question, or they can do it. Uh, they can finish a set of questions and then go back. Um, next to that tab that says workspace, there's a thing that says check answer. So if you yep. click on that. Yep. So. That uh, contains the answer, which is just taken from the back of the book. And the student can compare their answer, which David has forgot to do that final step there, but um, comparing their answer to the uh, textbook answer and then giving themselves a confidence rating uh, from a sliding scale of a frowny face to a, a green smiley face about how they went on the question. So that the reason we did that is to um, avoid going into marking, students marking themselves as just simply correct or incorrect given that they're really marking their solution rather than just, just their answer. So if, if they've done, uh, if they know how to do something and they've got other questions correct but in this particular question for example they've just incorrectly, uh, they've just made a calculation mistake on that final step and their answer doesn't match the textbook answer it would not be reflective to just mark themselves as zero, give themselves a zero, just a straight incorrect. So mm. they can give themselves an, an orange, for example, on this one to reflect the fact that they just were a bit careless at the end. If they had absolutely no idea, they could give, and they tried a few times, they just kept getting something wrong, or they didn't even know how to start the question, they could give themselves, uh, click on the red box, and then they could go across to that, uh, that check box there, and click the box next to the text that says, let my teacher know that I had a lot of trouble with this question. So once the student uh, submits their work and they can go through and check, uh, use this self-assessment tool for as much work as the teacher had given them, they can submit that to the teacher. As David mentioned before, the teacher can see all of, it just records, say David just wrote his handwriting there, the teacher will be able to see that exactly what David has just written. <coughs> The um, teacher will also see a list of, uh, they'll see a pie chart that some, I don't know if you have this in your slideshow, David, but a, a pie chart that 
um, summarizes the amount of questions that were green, red, uh, orange, or whatever. Um, but probably most importantly, they will get a list in a table of the questions that their students have ticked this box for that says, let my teacher know I, I had absolutely no idea of this question. So a list of red flags. So um, I'll show you a couple of those slides in yeah, a minute, that, if that I could. Sense, but but that's, uh, that's the gist of the self-assessment. Yeah, it's important to know that all that feedback from the students and all their handwritten working is saved and visible by the teacher. And that goes for all the exercises. You can see the shortcut through to the different sections in the text, like if you wanted to jump straight to the reasoning section. And as you might be aware, all questions have answers plus fully worked solutions. And teachers have the control on that as to whether or not the work solutions are switched on or off for their classes. Just quickly, just run through the other couple of resources. Um, there is a resource tab which includes all the digital resources um, over and above um, the exercise, including all the examples for the section, other more interactive widgets, and extra um, worksheets and investigations which are connected to this topic. So, you know, probably too many resources for each class, but at least we have them all there available. Um, also available are the walkthroughs, which are examples that you might know are controlled by the student. So they start off with an example and they get to control the steps. So it's like we walk through an example, but in a digital format. One thing that has been reviewed heavily for this series are the quizzes. And so for each lesson, there are three quizzes available. Easy, medium and challenging. And they have been reviewed to make sure that the connection between each question and the section content is very, very strong. The Scorch there, another feature is the Desmos calculator that you may have heard about. The Desmos graphing calculator. Uh, there's a direct link now to this calculator, so there's no need to be going off to and searching for this. So let's I'll just quickly give you a sample. Let's do y equals ax plus b. And I'll add some sliders in there so we can play around with the gradient or the y-intercept. Very powerful piece of software. That's the Desmos graphing as well as Desmos geometry where I'm not sure if people use Geometry Sketchpad, for example, in the past, but a lot of the features of, say, something like that can be done. Let's do a quick circle theorem. Let's go, let's create this angle and another one subtended by the same arc from here to here. And I'll just quickly measure these angles. Okay, so there we have it. Two angles on, on the circumference says subtended by the same arc are equal. And if I'm in select mode, you can see that you can alter the different cases there as well. So I'm not sure if you use that much dynamic geometry, but it's now built in as a feature that you can just jump to on the system. All right, so just, that's just one of the things I wanted to show you. And just quickly now, if I can just go back to our PowerPoint. Um, as Scott was talking about for, before, with, when students are filling in their, their results and clicking certain buttons about how they feel about a question or if they want to seek help, there is feedback that's provided for the teacher. So as an example, you can see here that Linda has completed 99% of the exercise, but is having a lot of trouble and has clicked the red flag 16 times. If you're wanting more of a whole class summary for the students in your class, you can see where the red flags are coming up as well. So Nick, for example, is red flagging almost every question that he attempts. Now, this is in terms of um, teacher feedback, um, the teacher will see something like this for each question where if teachers want to view 
what students are actually typing or writing, they'll be able to do that from their teacher site as well. So this, the student we're looking at here has only done 3% of the work, but we're starting to see some of the results coming in. I just chime in here once again, just to say a few things. So one is that there is no expectation that uh, you would need to use uh, this, these features for all of your work. You could just choose a couple of questions. You could just not use it at all. Mm. Or you could just choose a couple of questions in an exercise, like what they call an exit <coughs> pass or something like that. Um, or for the novelty value or something like that. So it, it, there's no requirement to do, uh, you can do as much or as little of this kind of work as you would like to. The other thing is that there are a lot of advantages though to at least using it uh, some of the time just because there's a lot of data that is collected without you doing any, any work. It, it, a lot of useful information is there. The other thing is that I think this is probably a good opportunity to have a talk uh, if, you're, if you are doing this with your students about what it means to be a bit self-critical when you are going through your own work. What does it mean to give yourself a, uh, the green highly confident with your answer? What, what does that mean? What does it mean to, uh, what does orange mean? Um, what does correct and incorrect mean in MathMag? What, uh, what is almost fully correct? What is, what is zero mark? So all of those uh, things are, are good. And, mm. and you, it's true that uh, some students may completely misuse this. They might, give, they might do no work, they might give themselves green uh, and a big tick for everything, the entire exercise, but you can actually check. You can check if there's any work, they actually submitted any work. You can check what they actually did and you can have a talk with them if they are or aren't using these uh, tools as you would like them to. I think one of the things we wanted to do was make sure there was the opportunity, if they're using digital all the time, there is an opportunity to show working. Because I, I don't want my students coming through year seven, year eight, year nine, year 10, just simply typing an answer into a box on a system and getting right or wrong. Because I don't think that will develop their mathematics and they won't be setting out their work and they won't be communicating their math. So um, with, with the digital features that we're offering, we felt it was important to provide that system where they can do their handwritten working typing if they want to, but the handwritten option as well. So we're very excited about that. So thank you very much, Scott, for helping me out today. And I think that's uh, the end of the presentation. So thank you very much for coming.